Good morning. Uh, I hope you had a nice and uh, resting uh, night. Uh, if not, we're going to have a smooth start this morning. So um, my name is François Yvon. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm mostly uh, working on uh, machine translation these days. And I'm going to uh, do um, a week-long uh, class on uh, NLP, uh, starting with a very uh, broad introduction to NLP. My assumption was most of you don't know NLP, or if you believe you know, know NLP, in fact, you don't. I mean, that would be my assumption. Uh, so what I'm going to uh, do is to, um, try to uh, go back in history and explain why machine uh, why NLP has become, or maybe not become, a subfield, an applicative subfield of machine learning. So you tell me at the end whether it is really uh, an applicative subfield of NLP. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be uh, talking uh, in the late afternoon uh, about language modeling, which are more recent uh, advances uh, in NLP. And then I'll, uh, I'll talk a bit about multilingualism, uh, the diversity of language and the, the issues that are raised by the diversity of languages of the world. But before we start, uh, I give you some pointers. So I think the third one was available on the internet at one point. So the recent class book, or if you're interested in NLP, you can have a look at it. The last one is the most recent one, and it was available online for it. But before we start with a, a nice uh, chat at, uh, at lunch with Aurelien last, yesterday, and he told me, uh, I don't understand these people working on argumentation. What are they doing? Uh, I mean, that doesn't work. It will never work. So I'm going to uh, play a small uh, film. So before I start the, the film, what do you see on screen? So this one is, uh, is like the presenter of this show. And he's introducing two uh, contestants at the... Uh, uh, Debating uh, challenge. So this one is uh, I graduated from Cambridge. is uh, like uh, the world champion of debating. Uh, arguably, you'll see. I mean, I, I you got, if you watch uh, the, the full movie, you'll see whether it's good or not. And the second one is this one. So this is a machine. This is a debating machine. And uh, I'll tell you uh, a word about uh, this uh, debating machine. So this is a. Uh, the beginning of the challenge. So I don't know if you have uh, ever played debating contest. So typically there are two rounds. First, the, the, the two speakers will uh, take uh, a stance for or against something. So basically you arrive, they give you one subject, and they give you, you have to be in favor of, or you have to be against of. And then you have five minutes to start your, and then in the second round, you have to answer the other guy's argument. So you can say the first time it's easy for the machine, she has to make up her own uh, arguments, but the second time she has to understand her opponent's arguments and to prepare uh, the spur of the moment, uh, uh, counter arguments, rebuke whatever the opposant has. She will be arguing for the resolution, we should subsidize preschool. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go, Project Debater. Greetings, Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against humans, but I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. I will argue that we should subsidize preschools. We are going to talk about financial issues, but not only about them. In the current status quo, we accept that the question of subsidies goes beyond money and touches on social, political, and moral issues. When we subsidize preschools and the like, we are making good use of government money because they carry benefits for society as a whole. It is our duty to support them. Subsidies are an important policy instrument. They provide governments with the means through which to pursue industrial development and ensure the livelihoods of their citizens. There are two issues I will elaborate on now. I will start by explaining why preschool is an important investment. I will also say a few words about poverty and I will end by discussing some other issues that show the positive aspects of preschools. Regarding investment, nature-based preschools are powerful interpretive programs as well as lucrative business decisions. As I mentioned, preschool is an important investment. 
For decades, research has demonstrated that high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, <laughs> I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. A statistical summary of studies from 1960 and 2013 by the National Institute for Early Education Research found that high-quality preschool can create long-term academic and social benefits for individuals and society, far exceeding costs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that universal full-day preschool creates significant economic savings in health care, as well as decreased crime, welfare dependence and child abuse. Former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said in 1973 that preschool is the greatest single aid in removing or modifying the inequalities of background, environment, family income or family nationality. Now to an additional, final issue. A study by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research shows that attendance at preschool has a significant positive impact on later NAPLIN outcomes, particularly in the domains of numeracy, reading and spelling. The results of a new study of over 1,000 identical and fraternal twins, published in Psychological Science, a journal of the Association for Psychological Science, confirmed that preschool programs are a good idea. Here is a study from New Jersey that is worth noting. In New Jersey, the follow-up to the AVID preschool program study continues to find that high-quality preschool programs increase achievement in language arts and literacy, math, and science through fourth and fifth grade. I hope I relayed the message that we should subsidize preschools. You will possibly hear my opponent talk today about different priorities and subsidies. He might say that subsidies are needed, but not for preschools. I would like to ask you, Mr. Natarajan, if you agree in principle, why don't we examine the evidence and the data and decide accordingly? Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen. So you get the idea. Uh, so this was not uh, prepared. Uh, just a few words about this project. So you may remember, like 15 years ago, a bit more than 50 years ago, IBM uh, launched a project, or well, well, was, succeed, was successful in a project that was uh, aiming at uh, winning at the Jeopardy game. Uh, they, they had the shows on TV, and if you, have, you haven't never seen that, that show, you can watch it on YouTube, where the machine is uh, basically uh, beating the best uh, Jeopardy player on, on stage. Uh, Francis yesterday said it was easy because I mean the machine had access to I mean all the encyclopedias uh, uh, and all the uh, knowledge of the world, whereas the poor uh, human players, they don't. So after that, they said, OK, what would be the next grand challenge? And uh, so they asked a research team within IBM, say, OK, what do you, what do you suggest? What are your, your ideas for, uh, for a grand challenge? And so this, uh, this team uh, from Noam Tobim, Tel Aviv, uh, was uh, proposed this challenge. And, uh, the, this research has been going on for like 10 years now. And this was the, one of the first public appearance machine on stage. After years and years of uh, rehearsal and uh, trials and errors, get uh, into the, uh, at least to do something reasonable. And it's also fun. I mean, uh, if you if you play the full film, you have also see, uh, you will also see uh, errors of the machine on the cases where she fails miserably, uh, delivering the wrong arguments uh, or insanities. And I mean, it's, uh, it's quite, quite fun. But I mean, this was uh, this was uh, this was more convincing. I hope. Uh, that uh, machines today, uh, if you uh, train them long enough, are, are capable of displaying amazing, uh, amazing abilities to process human language. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, comments to make or something that has uh, tried to continue. Uh, I think that was uh, three years ago. Uh, I mean, I, I, I got to know this project three years ago. I mean. Uh, I think this was one of the first. I mean, it, so I mean the project is still ongoing. I mean, there, still, uh, there was, an, I think, a Nature paper years ago, but can I can have a look? And I mean, when you when you look at it uh, more carefully, you will see that I mean uh, a lot of what she says, in fact, is reading 
uh, documents or subparts of documents that have been found, that found in the uh, in a huge uh, database of documents. And you've, you've heard uh, the machine uh, quoting long, long extract from a report. So the trick is to get the right reports, to get the right sentences, then to uh, devise uh, the right argument, and then speak it aloud, which is pretty fine. But then the second part is even more uh, puzzling because, I mean, it has to somehow uh, recognize the speech of the opponent, uh, again, understand, classify it, uh, its uh, arguments against, and find an answer, again, in our database, its database, uh, an answer to this uh, counter argument. So you see a lot uh, of abilities, in fact, uh, are, uh, are put in this uh, kind of uh, technologies. And it may seem like a game, but uh, like Geopardy, it started with a game, and now it's a very powerful system that does uh, question answering for um, uh, uh, physicists. Uh, and I, I guess they have also plans to uh, find a nice uh, business application for this kind of thing. Just to re rehearse debate or to train people. In, in, uh, I guess uh, many of you in the room, I mean, I would be, uh, I would be, uh, I would have a hard time, I mean, uh, on the stage, uh, uh, debate about uh, subsidizing preschool, even though I'm convinced uh, <laughs> that we should do so. Maybe even more convinced now, but uh, uh, that, that's not so easy to do and to find the right. But, uh, OK. So you have the address. I mean, uh, at some stage, you'll get access to the slide. You can uh, the full movie, because at the, uh, after the, uh, the first part of the show, uh, the, uh, the main developer, the lead developer, uh, will come on stage and will try to explain a bit what's going on behind. More information. So uh, the plan now is to uh, to first uh, try to uh, introduce natural language processing as a scientific field and try to um, uh, give you an idea of what was a common view. Uh, what were the common views about NLP uh, before, uh, before people started to look at the uh, uh, program? So I took this definition from a uh, with Karl Gazda, and he, he, he mentioned that there are at least three uh, scientific reasons why uh, people were interested in uh, natural language processing these days, the 96. It's about when uh, people started to work more on, on application. And you see that probably what is, uh, from your perspective, the, the, the main part of the, of the field comes only uh, last. So uh, at, that, at that stage, at that time, uh, applications were not so important. What was really important is to help linguists devise models uh, that you could implement, gram grammatical models, morphological models that you could implement, that you could play with, and which could be useful to test hypotheses regarding uh, the structures of the world. Uh, not only the formal structure, but also the statistical or distributional properties of language. That was really the core of the discipline. And there was also a smaller trend. People working in, in computational psycholinguistics tried to, to look at the way the brain processes speech and see how we could try to reproduce this uh, with machine. For instance, there, is a, there are many, many, uh, many signs that uh, we process uh, uh, sentences uh, uh, online, that is, we, uh, as soon as we get uh, words, we start to produce elements of structure in our head. So we are building uh, a language, linguistic structure long before the end of the sentence, whereas uh, most computers that will uh, wait for a full sentence and then build a structure. We don't do that. So people are, we are for instance, in that uh, second uh, uh, sub area of research, are trying to uh, build models where you could build uh, structures, uh, technical structures on the fly without having to wait for the end of the sentence. Several years uh, uh, later, later uh, in, the, in their book, uh, and Martin, you can see already the change. Mostly we are defining the fields the field in terms of application. And you can see a lot of keywords that are important today. Natural language understanding, speech recognition, speech synthesis, generation, information retrieval, information attraction. All this uh, was uh, um, developing at a very high pace, uh, so that nowadays uh, NLP is mostly understood as the field that uh, cares about uh, applications that deal with language. 
and uh, only a few uh, few people in the field are, are still interested uh, to look at uh, psycholinguistics. Or, and so that, that still exists, but maybe a bit outside of the mainstream of NLP. So if you look at uh, NLP or at the language processing uh, in an analytical, analytical way, uh, and you, you think, try, try to decompose all, all that the machine has to do to get to the level of uh, like comprehension or, uh, or, or abilities that uh, the project debater is doing, uh, you have to go through a series of steps. And that was typically how language processing was thought of uh, years ago, where you should start with a speech wave, something like this, whatever you, you get in your mix. Mike. The first step would be to uh, recognize, uh, so it is a very difficult step to go from the uh, uh, continuous time domain, speech, to uh, the a series of, of discrete events. So uh, here, uh, reproduce as a, as a series of uh, phonemes. So I must apologize for the non-French speaker in the room. I don't know how many of you don't speak at all French. I will have a lot of examples in uh, this first part, and most of them will be in French. If you get them, I mean, please ask. Uh, so this is a, a phonetic transcription of whatever was, uh, was said. And uh, you can see that from this transcription, not, not, not everything is, uh, is an, um, useful. So the next step would be to identify subparts in this uh, long stream of uh, symbols, and even parts that were uh, not necessarily useful for the rest. For instance, in this sentence, there is an, an hesitation, which is uh, uh, uttered. So in red, at that stage, so I read for you, le cousin de Paul se piquait de bien, euh, de bien connaître sa ville. Okay. This part, uh, typically, has to be identified and has to be removed because it's uh, just an hesitation. You don't need to uh, take it into account for the next. So speech recognition systems were typically doing this in some, uh, some form or, or, or another. Um, and I mean, there was a full the part of the field that was just concentrating on solving this uh, very difficult problem to go from the speech wave to uh, a discrete, uh, discrete uh, sequence of our words. So th the next step uh, would be to turn this phoneme stream into words. Again, not so easy, not so easy as I will show you because, uh, because of uh, the fact that uh, the same uh, sound sequence can be written in several ways. So you have to find the right way to spell it. For instance, PK for an E here, as there are many ways to write PK uh, French. It can be the verb, it can, it can be various conjugated forms as a verb, it can be also PK like uh, uh, a stick, and maybe uh, other, other forms. So you have to find the right one uh, in context. And if you, uh, if you are able to do this, we can go on uh, this, this uh, sentence. So there is a small, uh, but not uh, an important part, which is to go from uh, whatever uh, uh, written version of the speech you have to, uh, sorry about this, to uh, a written form. So again, you have to uh, realize that the speech is not like written language. So we have uh, the ability to process both, uh, or to handle both of them. Uh, we have uh, we've not learned to speak. We have learned to write, so the two are a bit different. We have uh, much more uh, speech abilities than uh, written abilities. I mean, some of us, uh, or may, may, many languages are not even written. So I mean, uh, written is like a derivative uh, technology, even though it, uh, for us it's very natural to think language in terms of uh, writing systems and orthography and uh, all that comes with it. But uh, in fact, for humans, most humans don't have uh, or don't they use not to have any writing system. Writing systems are relatively recent in the history of to speak. So you have to turn whatever you have recognized into uh, a written form. So typically, this will mean to uh, add punctuations, stuff like that, which are really important uh, to process uh, whatever you have recognized. The next step is about uh, on what's thought to be about uh, what we call morphology. On syntax. So the first part of it would be to identify uh, categories 
of words. So uh, under each word, uh, there is a categorical label uh, that identifies the uh, function of the word in the sentence. This task has been uh, like uh, uh, almost uh, a core task of NLP for many years. It's not so, it's not so easy. It's called part of tagging, and I, I'll, I'll talk about again about part of tagging uh, in the common uh, in the next uh, slide. It, it's difficult because again, uh, ambiguity uh, is everywhere. And many words you don't see as ambiguous, or you don't feel as ambiguous, are in fact uh, ambiguous. And uh, the, first, the first word in this sentence, the determiner de, uh, le French, is ambiguous. It can be a determiner on a pronoun. And it's one of the most frequent tokens in, uh, in words, in, in sentences. So every time a machine sees le, it has to decide whether it's a, word, it's a determiner or a pronoun. And likewise with la, and likewise with many common words. So this task seems easy, but I mean, for a very uh, long time, it was uh, thought uh, um, to be extremely difficult. Another way to make it more difficult is to introduce more categories. In, a, uh, in that slide, there are only a few categories. But you can also uh, assign or, uh, each word with uh, morphological features, like is it singular, is it plural, is it what it stands, what it would, And these uh, features are uh, also useful for the further processing. So again, this was sort of, uh, for a very long time, a difficult task. And uh, for many languages, it's not yet solved. I will show you numbers at the end of it. So if you're able to do this, uh, the next step would be to identify structure. Uh, language, um, language is, is, is seen as a, as a sequence of uh, symbols, of discrete units, and that's the way we receive it. But there are uh, a multitude of evidence that inside our brain, we process language as something that has a, a, an internal structure that is hidden. And uh, if you don't recognize that, uh, that structure, uh, you may not, in fact, understand sentence. Uh, word order is a typical, uh, the typical uh, reflection of this, uh, of this structure. And we know that depending on the word order, the meaning can change sometimes in a dramatic way. So you have to identify the structure. And identifying the structure is typically thought of as a building trees, uh, even though trees are not uh, universally recognized uh, as a good representation for all the world's language. But basically, you have to identify trees. So this is one kind of, uh, of tree. Uh, I'll be talking uh, a bit more the next. Uh, Slides with a small caveat, as you can see, the notion of a word uh, in a, of a orthographic word doesn't exactly match the notion of a syntactic word. So in this example, you have a pronominal form, pro pronominal form, tupite, which acts as two orthographical words and one uh, syntactic word. It has to be uh, processed as one unit. Okay, so there is again another kind of ambiguity that uh, that you can. Uh, in this slide, the ambiguity of segmentation. We have, we have sets of tokens, but we don't know how to segment them. And finding the right segmentation is also sometimes. So these trees, what do they show? They show relationship between words. So in this representation, uh, each, each word uh, has to uh, uh, locate or to identify its head word on the main uh, Head word, so the head word for the full sentence is typically the, the, uh, the verb. So in that example, ce pique is the main, uh, main uh, component of the sentence. And it has dependent, so one dependent is its subject. You see the subject is, uh, is not the nearest word, so its subject is not Paul. The subject is cousin. And in that example, it doesn't really matter. But in fact, it matters because uh, in French and in, in German and in many other languages, you have agreement phenomena whereby verb has to agree uh, for several uh, morphological features with the subject or in other language with the object. So you have to identify not only, uh, uh, you have to identify the object. On, uh, you, in, many, in many cases, you cannot relate on uh, proximity. Hopefully, in English, you can relate on word order. So typically, the object. The subject is before the verb, so you know at least where to look. In many, in many languages, you don't know where to look. The object can be also at the end. The subject can be at the end. I mean, for those of you who took uh, Latin 
in uh, smaller classes, you know that sometimes finding the subject is difficult, even for a human, even for a trained human, so even so more for each, each uh, so for, for this uh, syntactic analysis, uh, another uh, third part of the task is to label the dependency. So you not only have to find uh, the arcs, but also to label the arcs with uh, categorical labels that indicate the relationship between the head and its dependent. Is it a subject? Is it a determiner? And this is necessary uh, uh, because once you've abstracted away uh, what is uh, unnecessary in this uh, typically determiners and stuff like that, you can start building a semantic representation, something that will uh, abstract away from the words to something that is more um, formal and can be processed by a, by a computer to do some kind of uh, reasoning. So the main verb is supique. So basically, this sentence, it's the, the core uh, semantic unit, is simply that there is an action that is labeled by the uh, main verb. So that this, this sentence is about the act of supique de, which in French means uh, being proud of, in a, in a more formal way. Then if you, if you just follow the syntactic relationship, uh, Supique has two uh, arguments. One is, yeah, is a subject, uh, and the other is its object. And typically, uh, the relationship between a subject and first argument, an object uh, and second argument, is, very, is, uh, is the most common one, but it can also be reversed in passive. So the association between the subject and the argument of the verb, again, depends on various factors, uh, morph morphological properties of the verb, and also word order. So if you go into, uh, if we uh, try to complete this, syntax, this semantic representation, we have two uh, more objects in the scene. There is one uh, cousin, so it has, uh, it has a label C, and it is uh, of the type cousin, and one has a uh, label K, and, it's, uh, and there you can see already the recursive structure of, uh, of language. The argument of a verb can be itself a verb. This is a very important property uh, of language. Uh, one of the defining property of, you, of human language, uh, the fact that within clauses you can have clauses, and within these clauses you can have again clauses, the recursivity of it, which um, justifies the fact that we look for hierarchical structure when, uh, when we look at them. So what's interesting is that uh, connaître, so this argument, being a verb, it also has a subject and an object. So its object is clear, it's Bill, and we already have the relationship on the graph. So we know the object of connect, which will be the R1 of this verb, is, is explicit. But there is no uh, subject in this sentence. While semantically, connect has to have a uh, uh, first argument, but there is no overt uh, uh, subject. So you have to do some uh, kind of uh, uh, inference to realize that in that case, uh, because of the structure of the main verb, the uh, subject of connaître is shared with the subject of speak. So that's why we, you have here again the argument zero here as the same label as the argument zero. Okay, so supique is uh, one of those verbs where when it has a verbal argument, the verbal argument shares the subject with the subject of the, of the verb. The main. Okay? And this is interesting because this kind of structure is no longer a tree. Now it's a graph with reentrancy. And in fact, uh, even today, building, uh, uh, deriving graphs uh, from, uh, from sentences, uh, graphs like that, so that they can be processed or turned into uh, a formal language, like an SQL uh, uh, request, uh, query, or uh, any kind of formal language, is still an open issue. And we can do this for very, very simple uh, uh, clauses, but we can do this in general. Uh, even for English, uh, where there is a lot of, uh, of work going on. So if you're interested, you can ask Kayo, which is who is sitting just here, is uh, working on this uh, area. He can tell you uh, much more than I do. But okay, another another uh, task uh, that is related to semantic processing of language is what we call worsens this ambiguity. So uh, maybe you haven't. Uh, thought about it, that cousin is a, is a poly, polysemic uh, noun in French. At least it can be a, a, a human being, 
uh, tied with some uh, uh, family relationship. So they would be this uh, illustrated by this image, but it can be also an insect. And I mean, I have chosen a case where Piquet uh, can, uh, you know, make you think of the insect, even though cousins don't, uh, they don't, they don't bite, they don't sting. Okay, so you have to make that decision. And again, this looks like, in that case, a simple decision. But in many cases, it's not so simple. And again, this kind of uh, issue, what sense is ambiguation, finding the right word in the right context, or the right meaning in the right context, has been subject to a, a very long or very uh, difficult uh, research for many, many years. Uh, in fact, uh, the domain started like in, in the 50s with attempts to uh, do machine translation of uh, Russian text English, and uh, Watson's disambiguation was when wo one of the first uh, wall that was hit by the, the researcher at the time. They were unable, in fact, to uh, devise uh, good enough Watson's disambiguation. So issues uh, regarding Watson's disambiguation have been uh, 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 nourishing a whole subfield of activities in NLP for many years, and they have been, of course, uh, uh, rejuvenated by the uh, advent of uh, embeddings and stuff like that that we'll discuss in the coming uh, hour. So this is uh, what we call language analysis. But in fact, a machine like Project Debater has not only to do language analysis, but it has also to do language generation. Okay, so it has to go from uh, something like this, like a formal representation of language, and go all the way uh, up to the generation. Some stages are, are easy. Some, te some stages are really difficult, especially the, the planification of the syntactic structure from the semantic structure is really difficult. There are many ways you can uh, uh, fill out uh, a structure like this into a linear uh, sequence of words. And uh, there are many constraints that, uh, that are at play, especially when you have reentrancy in your graph, the way you will select your pronouns or you will. Uh, use uh, a shared argument is really, uh, really difficult to plan, to plan and requires to know exactly how each verb behaves uh, syntax, syntax. So, this is, so this is basically what you have to do when you process sentences, isol isolated sentences. But of course, language is not about isolated sentences. We speak for, for reasons most of the time, because we have to uh, exchange information or because we have to uh, discuss uh, about the various issues. And uh, when you uh, look at uh, what you need to do to process longer uh, bands of text, like here a dialogue, uh, there are many other uh, processing steps that you need to take. One of them, uh, for instance, is a reference resolution for phenomenal re reference resolution, where you can see in this, uh, in this small excerpt that we have uh, a number of uh, actors in this scene even though uh, not all of them are known. So there is uh, a yellow actor, uh, which appears as I in this sentence, but uh, it also he or she also appears at me in this sentence. And it's the same person. If you look the full dialogue, you will realize it's the same person. There is also a yellow uh, actor, a yellow, uh, sorry, a violet or pink actor with Q in that sentence, but the same guy is I in this sentence. So on the different forms, it's the same person. And I in this sentence is not the same person as I in this sentence. Okay? And of course, for you, it's obvious, because I mean, you have a speaker A, speaker B, but again, for a machine, uh, maybe more difficult. And there is a third, third person, Mr. Kenton. Okay? And there is then objects, there is its uh, it room, and there are times. And all of this can be uh, replaced by pronouns. And finding out for which pronoun, which is the right reference, is the, and yet, and yet, think about machine translation, for instance. In machine translation, you would need, for instance, to, well, we, well, if, you, if you machine translation this in French, you would have to uh, find the right uh, gender for pronouns and to keep a consistent gender. So for instance, if you, decide, if you decide that one of the speaker is female, he has to be female at all turn, meaning, uh, uh, meaning, um, and, and this has consequences, for instance, on agreement. Okay, so uh, finding the, the, the right uh, links between pronouns and their uh, reference 
is also something that is needed if you process dialogue or if you process long spans of text. Another task that appears uh, necessary uh, to uh, uh, move or progress toward the understanding of text is to relate uh, orthographical strings to uh, objects or person in the physical world. And nowadays, we, we can identify people in the, in the real world with the Wikipedia page, for instance, and likewise for brands and likewise for places, we can locate them with coordinates. So uh, an important task in NLP is to uh, process text and uh, identify mentions, like uh, we talk about someone under various keys, and to relate all these mentions to the same entity in the world. And this task of entity linking is, uh, is now that from at scale, uh, for instance, on Wikipedia, where uh, all this happens behind the scene, and it allows uh, uh, you to see a small uh, extract uh, to also uh, uh, turn Wikipedia into some kind of database with uh, structured information that can be uh, then used to uh, uh, reason or to uh, improve the Okay, I mentioned uh, a few other tasks that are uh, important uh, in NLP today. One is, uh, is about uh, categorizing sentences or short text. And uh, in social media, it has turned to be a very uh, important uh, task. Uh, categorizing meaning assigning a, a, a discrete label, like is it a positive or a negative tweet in that case? Is it a sarcastic, a sarcastic or non-sarcastic tweet? This is also important to detect the hateful, hateful speech on the internet. Uh, is this uh, uh, extract against or for some subject? I mean, you've seen a project debater. It has to uh, categorize each argument as in favor or against uh, some uh, position. And all these tasks are important and can be uh, viewed as a uh, in various instances of uh, text specification for, uh, in that case, short text. Uh, another task that has been uh, used a lot and that you will see uh, a lot these days in a, in a huge uh, challenge of uh, NLP component is uh, entailment. Entailment simply means the ability to recognize a relationship between adjacent sentences, uh, whether one entails implies the other or it uh, contradicts the other or it has no relationship with the other. So you have three examples where uh, uh, you have uh, a first uh, priming uh, sentence, and then three sentences uh, illustrating each type of relationship you can have with the previous one. And then, uh, argument structure, so please, uh, please Aurélien. Uh, Finding the argument structure of a document. Uh, arguments are not just uh, like a se sequences of sentences. They are logically organized. And if, you, if you'd like to, uh, to make a convincing summary of long documents, like a full article, full, full scientific articles, stuff like that, you need to be able to identify the role of each, uh, each uh, sentence in the argumentation so that you can then uh, select the ones or rewrite the ones that are done. So this is an LP. So and in the in the old time, the old time, not so long ago. Uh, so NLP was uh, was viewed as a as a series of steps that we you should have to perform, and uh, you should perform the each step correctly so that you can then uh, perform the, the next one. And the analogy, of course, was uh, uh, computing uh, artificial language. So I, I haven't mentioned that, but. Uh, NLP uh, in French is referred to natural language processing. Why natural language? Of course, because it's not artificial language. Artificial language is uh, C, C++, uh, whatever you like, Java, and uh, natural language is our language. So um, the analogy was uh, with, uh, with uh, computer science, which was also developing uh, around the same uh, times. And uh, so, Speech uh, or language understanding was, uh, was viewed like a compilation process, where you would have to go through each step, uh, and after each step, you could uh, then uh, go to the next. So again, I have, uh, I have uh, indicated on that slide all the hierarchy of steps you, could, uh, you, you had to uh, go through to understand uh, language. And it was nice because this uh, hierarchy 
was more or less uh, aligned with what linguists uh, would define as subfield of linguistics. So you had a subfield of linguistics that was uh, concerned about sound, uh, sound patterns, prosody and uh, phonology. You had a subfield in linguistics that was uh, concerned with the uh, structure, the internal structure of words, so morphological structure of words. And then you have syntacticians and you have semanticians and also you have people who were uh, looking after uh, discourse uh, analysis. So that was nice. So this is called like a, a huge pipeline. But the fact is this, um, this pipeline really never worked, never fully worked. And it was uh, uh, after years and years of efforts to have each uh, small component uh, work perfectly so that the next component could be uh, uh, take, could take the, the output of the previous one and then uh, go on. It never worked. It never worked. One of the reasons is that uh, inside this box, there are multiple layers of dependency. So some are within a box, but there are also dependencies within box. So for instance, the way we speak, the, the words we can uh, like shorten or lengthen, all this depends on syntax. So already, when you need to process uh, the phonology, uh, the phonology in fact depends on the syntax, and the syntax will be processed uh, way down the pipe. So this kind of dependencies uh, appear uh, everywhere. And they are not uh, visible, they are uh, over. So uh, syntax is not visible. So you have to reconstruct syntax and maybe, uh, I mean, you would have to reconstruct syntax uh, so that you could, in fact, process uh, phonology uh, uh, correctly. So the, the fact that there are hidden dependencies in that pipeline was a, was, a, was a big issue. And in fact, you don't have this, hopefully, in a computing languages. You never have to uh, build your abstract tree to realize that your tokenization was wrong. I mean, you, you can tokenize deterministically and then uh, compute your syntax tree, etc. Compilation, you don't have any, any problem like this. And the other uh, main issue, uh, or one of the other main issues, was ambiguity. Ambiguity is all over the place. I will illustrate this uh, later. Uh, this is an ambiguity that is uh, rarely thought of, but is, this one is uh, it's close to my heart because. Uh, I do machine translation, and in machine translation, we have been using a lot, and a lot, and a lot, the uh, proceeding of the European Parliament, because these are uh, multilingual texts that are uh, widely available, and uh, there are a lot. But when you process this text, you find the word chair, and most of the time, if not always, chair is this. So when you use the Europarl training machine translation system, and you want to translate the word chair, it's sitting on the chair, most of the time, you will have, il est assis sur le président. And you, don't, you wonder why. But the reason is, there is hardly no mention of chair with that meaning in the Euro part. And of course, for you, I mean, I guess, uh, chair has the most obvious meaning of uh, being this, this thing. Okay? But in fact, uh, in some domains, uh, the other meaning is much more uh, uh, common and likely. And uh, for machine translation and stuff like that, and tasks like that, it, it's important to design it. And ambiguity, so I have illustrated this with a very simple uh, polysemy, but ambiguity is all over the place. I will uh, illustrate this in, uh, in, uh, in the next slide. The third reason why this pipeline never worked, in fact, is because we don't have clear ideas or clear theories of any of these books. I mean, you can, even for French or English or for languages that have been uh, studied for many years by scholars where you have uh, books, maybe the syntax or the morphology. These are still theories that are evolving, that are changing, uh, that can be challenged, revised, and that are only partial. So we have only a partial information. So it's like building a compiler, but you don't have the full syntax of the language. You have only a part of the syntax of the language. And the syntax is changing, because for some texts, uh, they are using one, one syntax, and other texts are using another syntax, but you don't know that. I mean, so uh, implementing, this pipeline is, uh, is in fact uh, nearly impossible due to the fact that uh, uh, language, language varies, and I will illustrate this uh, again uh, later. So there are uh, many sources of variation in language, and language changes, evolves, and of course you can also play with language. You can uh, invent or coin new words, and you can uh, coin new uh, linguistic structure over time, which will uh, uh, defeat any attempt to fix language into uh, these kinds of So this, not, this, this doesn't work. 
And uh, if you try to, to implement it, you can see uh, very quickly that uh, the errors you, you, will, uh, you will make at the earlier level will uh, accumulate on the pipe. So uh, uh, errors uh, in the early stages will have, uh, may have uh, great consequences. Uh, sometimes, as I said, uh, early decision would require a full analysis of the sentence to uh, identify the, the right, for instance, segmentation in words. And ambiguity is everywhere. So I have, I have illustrated this. Is, uh, so, il a la santé, okay? il a la santé can, can be written in many, many different ways. And in fact, you have no way to choose unless you know the full context. So, that would be my preferred uh, interpretation. Il a, il a la santé. But you can also uh, use this one or use this one. This is, this is more convincing, maybe. Jean Dujardin et Paul. So, this is, this is tough, not because of uh, Jean Dujardin, but because of a. Uh, this, this symbol, in fact, it's very short. In French, it can, be, it can mean the verb être, so it's extremely frequent. Or it can be the uh, conjunction E, also extremely frequent. And many, many, in many, many uh, phonological contexts, you cannot hear the difference. So these are the small mistakes that systems still make, even in, with clean speech. If you speak quickly, that's, that's extremely uh, easy to confuse. And of course, E can also be this one. And again, I mean, to, to choose which uh, is correct uh, is extremely difficult if you don't have any context. So this is a, an example of, uh, of uh, ambiguity. You have also segmentation ambiguity. So this is illustrated by this one. And then you have uh, ambiguities uh, uh, of segmentation at a higher level where uh, you can, have, uh, uh, you can uh, understand a sentence uh, either literally or uh, using idiom, so this is more like a, like a pun. Uh, look at this one. Uh, Pris la porte uh, means uh, go, go away, or especially if you're not uh, quiet in a, in a class, you can, you can, uh, the teacher can say, prends la porte. Okay, but I mean, uh, someone who is uh, doing a ski competition is also taking uh, doors, uh, and uh, prendre la porte à l'envers. Uh, can, can be interpreted in, uh, in two ways, at least in this sentence. And you can have many, many uh, cases like that. So ambiguity, for me, is not a, a, like a, a defect of language. It's more like a feature of language. And we, we, we play with it uh, when, we, when we speak. Uh, I will just uh, quickly mention other examples. I mean, this is just to illustrate that uh, uh, the, the a proliferation of ambiguities. Uh, some of them you don't even realize, even though they are, uh, they are still uh, happening in, uh, in today's French. So for instance, on, the third li on, the, on this line, so this, this one is interesting. This is a French word, a, constru a morphological construct that is built with a, a regular principle, a first verb group, gagé, with a, a typical suffix, ur. And you can find uh, many, many examples of this in French. You have voilé, voilure, monté, monture, uh, uh, etc. So gagé, gageur is, no, is not an issue. But uh, in modern French, uh, the sequence E, U can also be interpreted as a, as a digraph, which means the sound E. Uh. So there is another way to read this, depending on how you internally process this word. It can be gageur. In fact, the two, uh, so the, the two interpretations will yield two different pronunciations. So for in synthesis system, it would probably mean an, uh, an error, even though today I think that the two pronunciations are uh, accepted and you, you hear them. If you, if you pay attention, you will hear them uh, even on, on TV and radio. And this is uh, the effect of uh, morphological uh, ambiguity or segmentation ambiguity uh, within one. The, the other one is more historical, but I mentioned it because it's still happening in French in a couple of words. So in old, in, 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 in old French, uh, the sound near was written E, T, N, so the three uh, letters together to uh, refer to near. And uh, again, uh, when the E uh, is preceded by an O, there is another interpretation that tends to dominate today's is what? So, poignet. Now everybody says poignet, but uh, the old uh, uh, way to pronounce it was a poignet, uh, like a monion, like uh, etc. And the last word which is resisting this is uh, onion. 
even though it's, uh, it's likely that it won't resist very long, or and in, in, uh, in future times, uh, this uh, trace of old French will, will have disappeared, even in the, in the way we pronounce words. Uh, just to show ambiguities all over the place, I mean, this one is a real one, so I didn't make that up. I mean, I found it in a, in a newspaper. And it's typical of, uh, for those of you like me who don't read the English very well, you find these long titles in the, in the Guardian, in the newspapers, where, where uh, sometimes parsing them is difficult. And this is uh, one example. And in fact, if you, if you uh, remove the word appear, you can, you can think that this is about uh, barring female nudity in the US court. And of course, I mean, there is no law barring female nudity in the US court, even though I doubt that any uh, Supreme Judge uh, has ever appeared nude in the court. But, uh, but the, the, the meaning is completely different, of course. It, uh, it, uh, it, um, it's a defending Laconia uh, law. So there is a Laconia law barring female nudity. And uh, New Hampshire, the state, is defending Laconia law in a Supreme Court appeal. So it's appealing in front of the, super, uh, the Supreme Court to uh, defend this. Okay, but you see, again, the difficulty of parsing and the ambiguities that can result uh, in, in the analysis. OK, so let's uh, just take time. OK, I will, I will go quickly like this. I mean, just to, uh, to illustrate the fact that uh, language is evolving, language is changing. So we have uh, 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 the phonology is changing. Uh, so I mean, some contrasts in French have been uh, disappearing. The orthography is changing. Uh, new words are appearing. New meaning are appearing. Uh, uh, and we keep also uh, borrowing words from other languages, which means that if you uh, process uh, um, uh, like social media, you will, you will be uh, uh, faced with a lot, a lot of uh, words that you don't know of that are just borrowing from other language or ranges, uh, mashup of various languages. And this is even so, even so more, more true uh, for people who speak multiple languages and who tend to, uh, in a colloquial uh, discussion, to, uh, to mix several languages together. I mean, in fact, we do this uh, all the time. I mean, listen, listen to what happens in the next table uh, at lunch. You will hear people uh, speaking French with words in English about uh, uh, reinforcement learning or stuff like that uh, that would be inserted in the middle of sentences. So we, we uh, typically do this all the time. But of course, uh, if you'd like to uh, perform the kind of very uh, uh, formal analysis of this, it's difficult because, I mean, uh, you have to not only to uh, analyze one language, but several languages at the same time. And this, this illustrates the fact that we have new uh, ways to uh, coin words. Uh, some are regular, some are unregular. And um, so we need also to uh, revise our theories of language uh, across time. The last thing I want to mention uh, to illustrate in this first part the, uh, the set of difficulties people were typically uh, facing or discovering uh, trying to process language is the fact that, uh, and it's still something that you, you have to realize, it's the fact that even if you have uh, the whole Wikipedia in your memory, there are still uh, things that you cannot understand. There are still inferences that you cannot make because you don't have the knowledge of the world, uh, like a, um, a good representation of how the physical, work, the physical world works. So this is a small interaction uh, between, I mean, I guess you can, uh, you can understand, between a client in a, in a bar and the sentence is, uh, j'ai commandé une glace au serveur. And this is illustrated. So, commandé is ambiguous. Okay. It can mean order, but it can be also to command. So, there are two, two meanings of commandé. Glass is ambiguous, of course. It can be something you eat, but it can be also something you use uh, to, work, to, 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 to look at yourself. And then, server is uh, vastly ambiguous. It can be, of course, uh, the people who will bring the order. It can be also a computing uh, device, and it can be uh, probably. Uh, uh, also, uh, during Roland Garros, uh, if you look at TV, the server is not some, the guy who will bring you uh, something to eat, but is uh, the guy with, uh, with, uh, with playing on the field. Okay? So you can see all the ambiguities. And if you'd like to get the right interpretation of this sentence, you have to uh, uh, somehow disambiguate these ambiguities. And to do this, you have to, uh, to know, or the machine has to know, that server 
uh, is not a flavor. Recommending glass of a fraise. Fraise is a flavor. So, I mean, this is, uh, uh, and this, uh, in such a specific analysis, server is not a flavor. So you have to know this somehow. So that, that will bar one interpretation, one possible interpretation of this. Uh, and uh, a lot of the inference you need to make to get the right interpretation have to rely on an external knowledge, on grounding, on, a, on, a, on a external, uh, um, uh, yes, the external knowledge of the, of the one. OK, so this was more or less the state of play when I started my PhD. So it was not yesterday, but some years ago. Uh, so people were uh, exploring all these uh, sub areas of NLP uh, with more or less success. So we had small success in speech recognition, and we had uh, very, very small success in, uh, in parsing, for instance, uh, the building of, uh, uh, of uh, syntactic trees. And then, uh, and the, the, the general feeling about the field was that with more uh, resources, with more grammars, with more lexicon, with uh, a fine-grained uh, description of the, of the languages and all the, uh, all the words in the languages, maybe we could get to this uh, nice pipeline uh, scenario. Uh, when, uh, around 1992, uh, 1993, um, people discovered uh, statistics. People doing NLP, which were mostly computer scientists uh, or linguists or a mixture of both, discovered a set more or less. So the, uh, the uh, turning uh, event, maybe, is uh, the publication in the best uh, journal of the field, computational linguistics, of two uh, special issues on uh, corpora. Uh, 